Thanks for joining us, folks. We're going to talk about the hand exam. Hand exam is a little complicated. It's a pretty complex little tool. There are lots of little pearls that will help you. Also, it's an area where we actually make a fair number of mistakes in the emergency department. So let's try to see if we can get better. Focus on the little details and hopefully it'll help you on your next shift. From a general perspective, we should have a pretty healthy regard for hand injuries. A small injury can cause significant dysfunction. So I wouldn't say that you consider every hand injury patient a red flag patient, but as a minimum, you should consider it a yellow flag. So uh, Allison here, thanks for helping us out. We're gonna look at her hand. She's injured her hand here. One, a couple of things that are gonna help you for sure on your next shift. Never uh, examine a patient with an uh, extremity injury in isolation. Don't just look at the affected extremity, make sure you look at the other one as well. This is how we recognize subtle abnormalities. When we turn the hand over, a couple of things to note, and just relax your hand, just put your hands in a nice relaxed position. There is a normal cascade of the fingers. And this is a normal tone. There's a flexor tone of the hand, but there's an extensor tone of the hand. If she would have had a complete laceration of some of the tendons, it could be out, that finger could be out straight and it doesn't have the normal cascade. That would be a concern. Similarly, uh, if you ever saw that the finger's a little more flexed than the opposite side, if there's either uh, an injury like a fracture of some sort, or if there's an infection that's in this space. Uh, it doesn't like being out. It feels better when it's a little more flexed because you're not stretching it as much. So if you ever see there's an abnormal flexion in a finger, that also would be a concern for some sort of an abnormality. But these subtle differences, if they're small, you won't recognize it unless you see what normal's like. Similarly, um, if she had a laceration over on the dorsum of her hand, one thing to appreciate is on the dorsum of our hand, there's skin, there's bone, and in between there's tendon. There isn't a lot of soft tissue. So any laceration that's over the dorsum of the hand has a fairly high risk of injuring the tendon. And if we examine patients, they're lying on an arm board, and this is how we look at their hand, one of the concerns is we don't actually see their extensor tone. And you need to just bring their hand up, let their hand relax, and you'll see she has a normal extensor tone. If one finger was actually significantly more flexed, then you would know for sure she must have acutely or perhaps chronically, but likely acutely, she's actually lacerated an extensor tendon. But if her hand just sits in this position, you may not appreciate that. As well, because tendons are dynamic, the position her hand was in when she had the injury may have been with it flexed. When you examine it, it may be extended. So when we go through and do it, attend an exam, you've got to put them through the range of motion so you can visualize the tendon the entire length through. When I examine somebody who has an injured hand, if from story, I think they have a fracture, then obviously an x-ray will be a part of what we do. As a pearl to help you out, if they've injured just an individual finger, try to localize where the pain is. And then when you order an x-ray, order an x-ray just of that digit or of the thumb individually. Don't order a hand x-ray if they've actually injured just a single finger. What we want is when we order an x-ray, there's a thing called the central ray. That's where the beam is centered. If we order a hand x-ray, the beam is centered on the hand, on, over the mid-metacarpals. But if her injury is actually a finger, we want the beam centered over that finger. And that's why a difference between a finger x-ray and a hand x-ray can reveal some subtle abnormalities on the x-ray. So just ordering the test properly is super important. When we see patients with a hand injury, if we're worried about a fracture, if we've ordered a finger x-ray or we've ordered a hand x-ray, we are obliging ourselves on physical exam to see the fingers flex. This is an assessment for rotation, and this is commonly missed in the emergency department. Rotation is a subtle abnormality that is not picked up radiographically, but is picked up clinically. And when it's picked up clinically, it's picked up with the MCPs and the PIPs in flexion. It's very important. So if Allison were to have had a fracture, either of her metacarpal, proximal phalanx, middle phalanx, if it's rotated five degrees, that's very hard to check when her fingers are in extension. But if she flexes her MCPs and flexes her PIPs, what should normally happen is all the fingers should point towards the scaphoid. If there was five degrees of rotation in extension, when she flexes, it could be 20 degrees. It's four times. And functionally, we have to put the joint through, put the, the finger through the full range of motion 
so that we can see what it's going to do functionally. So not only does this reveal, by putting it in flexion, is it better to reveal the rotation as well? Um, this is actually what we do with our hand functionally. We just ensure that functionally they will be fine. Sometimes what we'll do is we'll actually send a patient to uh, x-ray before we uh, complete the physical exam. We just want to check to make sure there's not some significant fracture. Sometimes we're not sure if it's a fracture or a dislocation. Of course, having the x-ray is helpful. Check their sensation first. There are lots of different ways of doing it. The, the, the gold standard is two-point discrimination, but that's not really practical in an emergency department as such. Um, one thing you can do is just take a tongue depressor. You can just break it longitudinally, and you can just use this as a little sharp edge. And you need to separate out the radial and ulnar side of each finger. So whichever finger you're worried about, you can just do a little scrape. And again, when you compare, just compare to the opposite hand. Because some patients that do a lot of work with their hands, if they're laborers, constructors, they may have decreased sensation in their fingers normally. And what you want to do is just compare either to the neighboring finger or compare to the opposite hand, just to see what normal is like for the patient to make sure that they feel it completely. Depending on where the injury is, they could have a obviously an injury to their sensory nerve. Once you've decided, once you've checked their sensation and it's intact, then it's reasonable if you know you're going to do a procedure on a finger. You see that it's swollen, it's deformed. Um, you may not even completed the physical exam yet. You may not have even checked for rotation because you want to get the x-ray first uh, and you know you're going to do a procedure. You may want to then think about blocking the finger before you send them to x-ray. Totally reasonable thing to do. Make sure you check sensation first. If you're going to do this, um, especially again in cases where you know you're doing something to the finger, you just want to define the anatomy before you do your, your procedure. Um, one of the things you may want to think about doing is actually putting some bupivacaine, some long-acting local, uh, and using that because it'll last for a few hours. Where do you do the block? So the traditional way of teaching the block is to do a dorsal block, and then what you do is you go just parallel to the bone on the dorsal side, you might go across to get the, uh, the sensory nerve on the dorsal side, and then you need a second poke to go down on the opposite side of the finger. This is a traditional way of doing a block. It's a dorsal approach. Um, a number of years ago, I've switched over to doing a single palmar digital block. Uh, it does not work for the thumb. It only works from index to baby finger or index to fifth finger. And when you go across and do it, what you would do is just at the level, there's a, dig a digital crease just proximal to it, you can go, um, use a 30 gauge needle if you have them available. It's smaller, it's nicer for patients. You just drop down. If you're too superficial, it will feel like it's a little bit of a struggle to push in because you're in the subcutaneous space. If you're too deep, you're actually in the tendon. And the tendon doesn't really have pain fiber, so the patient may not notice it. So if you're not really sure of the anatomy, just ask them, just take their finger and just, you can actually even passively just flex your finger. And if the needle moves, when you're passively flexing the finger and extending it, guess what? You're in the tendon. So now you got to pull out a little bit just to be in that sweet spot where you can inject nice and easy. Inject slowly, inject generously, um, and it's gravity dependent. So once you do this block, it's a single poke, and they leave their hand like this for a few minutes, and then gravity just takes the local and brings it down, and it takes out the dorsal branches as well. So it's a wonderful way of doing a uh, digital block in the emergency department, a single Palmer digital block. These would be the landmarks of where you would go. Just make sure you're a little deeper than the subcutaneous tissue, but not so deep that you're in the tendon. Just takes a bit of practice and don't be, don't be shy. You'll see hand specialists put in sometimes five, six, seven cc's to knock out a finger. As we talk about the hand exam now, a very important part of the hand exam, an important part that's commonly missed in emergency medicine that's not well understood is actually testing flexor tendons and extensor tendons. In order to do this well, you need to really understand anatomy well. So the flexor side is the part that sort of confuses us the most. I'm just going to use a marker here, if you don't mind, Allison, just to identify on the flexor side, from second to the fifth finger, there are two flexor tendons to each finger. You need to understand what they do well, you need to understand how they operate, and then it'll guide you as to how to uh, examine for them. What we don't want you to do is actually just memorize it. So try to understand how this works. So on the flexor side, there's, super, uh, there's flexor digitorum superficialis, and underneath it is flexor digitorum profundus, FDS, FDP. They both run parallel, 
So if we're here going to her index finger, flexor digitorum superficialis comes, and what it does is it comes over the MCP, and just as it gets to the PIP, what it starts to do is it splits. And it splits in two, and it inserts on the middle phalanx. So this is FDS in red. It goes over the MCP, so it, it, it's a, one of the flexors of the, of the MCP. It goes over the PIP, and it's one of the flexors of the PIP. Coming underneath it would be the flexogen profundus. So basically, superficialis covers the profundus, covers the profundus, and when, when superficialis splits, profundus now comes through that tunnel, and it just inserts on the distal phalanx. This is really important to understand because the only tendon now that goes over the DIP is flexor digitorum profundus. If I want to check flexor digitorum profundus on any finger, all I need to do is check DIP flexion. So Allison, if you can just bend your fingers and see, as long as she can hold her DIP down of any finger, the only tendon that's doing that work is flexor digitorum profundus. Now, now the trick becomes, how do you examine flexor digitorum superficialis? The problem is, is that over top of the MCP, over top of the PIP, this is what superficialis causes flexion of, but it's also what profundus does. Now, the nature of profundus, it's a big muscle, but when you, it actually functions as one muscle. Superficialis works as four individual muscles. So what we can functionally do is we can eliminate profundus, and if we eliminate profundus, that allows us to isolate superficialis. The way we eliminate profundus is we just hold the other fingers out. So if I were just to hold it, you can just bend your finger. If I hold these other fingers out, the profundus is extended on all of these. And keep your finger bent as strong as you can. You can see here, actually I'll switch hands for the camera, it'll be easier. You can see here that she has no profundus working at all. She can't flex her DIP. Profundus is eliminated because I've held out the other three limbs of profundus. When they're held out, this fourth one is dysfunctioned as well. But keep your finger bent as strong as you can. She has very good superficialis. Okay. I can do this with any finger. Just bend your finger, strong. There you go. Keep it bent as hard as you can. Superficialis working fine. Profundus not doing anything. Bend your finger, strong. Super, profundus not working. Superficialis working well. So these are the ways, this is a very important thing to understand why we do this. We remember sometimes when we have to hold the finger down, we don't really understand why. If you understand the anatomy, it will certainly help you. On the extensor side of the hand, we have the extensor tendons, and there, are, there is some redundancy with some extra tendons to other fingers, but essentially the extensor tendon comes. It is a little tricky in that it splits in three. There's a central slip, there are lateral bands. But if you want to check the extensor tendon proper to see if it's extended or not, you need to check the extensor tendon with M against MCP extension. We need to take her hand up in the air, sorry, this way, lift your finger, this finger up strong, and it's with the MCP extended that I would then test and see her function. Don't do it with the MCP's flex. If I say flex, extend against my finger here, I could take my hand, if all of my extensor tendons are cut, I can actually do this fine because these are lumbricals. Lumbricals extend the IP joints with a flexed MCP. If I want to check extensor tendon function, I have to do it with the MCPs in extension. It's very important that way. Otherwise, this can all be done with your lumbricals. So in summary, FDS, FDP, remember how to separate them. Remember the anatomy, it's very important, how to isolate. FDP only goes to the DIP. FDS, you have to eliminate uh, FDP by holding the other fingers out. On the extensor side, when you examine for extensor tendon function, you need to do it with MCPs and extension. So in wrapping up, as we talk about hands in the emergency department, the hand exam, it's really important, again, compared to the opposite side, this will reveal subtle abnormalities. When you're worried about a fracture, you gotta look for rotation. That's when the finger's in flexion. Understand how the flexor tendons, how the extensor tendons work, understand how to examine them. You need to know this cold. We miss a lot of stuff in the hand, but if you pay attention to this stuff, you get this down, it'll give you a lot of confidence on your next shift. Hope that helps. <laughs>